tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 20. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. We have two stories for you this evening, and we definitely haven't done that in a while, both with interconnected theming and both written by the one and only Elias Witherow, an author of no small renown in the horror community. So don't you go running off now, unless of course you need a bathroom break, which I do suggest you take now, because you're about to be glued to your seat. <laughs> You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now... Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies, and nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, without further ado... From author Elias Witherow, I give you The Old Horns. When you've been a priest for as long as I have, you start to notice patterns in people. When a parishioner approaches, I can already guess what they want to ask me by their body language, or the way their eyes flicker to meet mine. It's quite funny, actually. Everyone thinks they're unique, that somehow they're different than everyone else. Well, let me tell you, after 38 years of hearing confessions, I've come to the conclusion that we're all pretty much identical. If I have to listen to one more trembling voice confess to watching pornography, I just might lose my mind. I haven't turned cynical in my old age, just weary. When you hear the same sins repeated over and over again, a thousand million times over, you begin to wonder if there's any hope left for the human race. I guess that's where the faith kicks in. Though now... Now, I'm not sure how much of that faith I still possess. You see, I don't practice anymore. I've given up the collar... I witnessed something that has shaken me to this day, and the shadow of its memory still haunts me. It was the last confession I ever did. I stifled a yawn, trying my best to remain awake as another sobbing parishioner left the confessional. The whole process had just become so mechanical to me that I barely even heard what was being whispered on the other side of the screen. I adjusted the cushion under my rear, feeling the familiar ache that had only gotten worse as my ears advanced. I checked my watch and saw I still had another twenty minutes to go. 
I closed my eyes and offered it up to the Lord, begging him to fill me with patience for these people. I heard the familiar creak of wood on the other side of the screen as yet another sinner took their place. I ran a hand over my weary eyes and then spoke into the screen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I recited, making the sign of the cross. A male voice whispered to me from the other side, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. This is my first confession. I shifted the cushion beneath me, annoyed at the distraction, and tried my best to focus on the man. Do not be afraid, my son. Tell the Lord what you have done. The man said nothing for a moment, his voice rasping behind the screen. Father, I don't think there's any hope for me. I've done so much. I sat up a little straighter. My son, there is no sin too great for God. The man struggled to keep his emotions in check, his voice straining. I think I, I've broken every rule in the book. Murder. Deception. Lust. The mention of murder sent a cold icicle shooting up my back. You killed someone? I asked, voice hardening. This was a serious confession, one I had never heard in all my years in the booth. I could hear the man begin to fall apart, shame and grief washing his words in sorrow. I've killed so many people. My heart was racing in my chest. Who have you killed? When was this? The man sniffled. It was a long time ago. I've been on the run for so long. I, uh, I don't know what to do anymore. My life is a lie. One big fake advertisement for something I'm not. I leaned into the screen, voice stern. Have you thought about turning yourself into the police? Coming clean will surely ease the weight of your sins. I can hear it in your voice. You are suffering. The man started to cry. <sighs> you have no idea. I knew I had to be delicate here. Son, the Lord's love is endless. He can forgive you these transgressions if you show him how truly sorry you are. The man surprised me by barking a laugh. Oh, his love is not endless. I swallowed, treading carefully. I know it's hard to understand, to accept, especially when you're feeling so low, but hear me, nothing is too great for the Lord. His wisdom and love for you are deeper than the oceans and broader than the universe, and he wants you to know that to feel that in your soul. The man was recovering and he snorted behind the screen. Oh, you couldn't be more wrong. Slightly frustrated, I pressed him. What makes you say that? Suddenly, the man's voice filled the entire booth. A deep rumble that shook me to the very core of my soul. Because I am your lord. I blinked, my head spinning. This was new. Just what kind of person was I dealing with here? I suddenly realized that the mental state of this person could be seriously compromised. After a moment, I decided to play along a little longer. You're the lord. I can hear your doubt. I sniffed. Well, forgive me if I'm a little cautious around someone who proclaims they're the son of God. There is no son of God, the man said, irritated. Just me. You guys made up all that Jesus bullshit. I had nothing to do with that. My mind was spinning as I tried to keep up. Okay. So, who are you really? And what are you doing in my confessional? The man exhaled. 
I just told you who I am. And I'm here to make peace before I die. Or whatever happens to me afterwards. I don't really know how I die. I never really thought about it before. I decided it was time to start steering the ship back on course. When a soul dies in the good graces of God, it gets sent to heaven. The man laughed. <laughs> oh no, oh no, 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 you are wrong. You are all wrong. What are you talking about? I asked, feeling anger begin to stir in my chest. The man's voice dropped low. Heaven is fucking gone. I cocked an eyebrow, the seriousness in his voice giving me pause. What do you mean, gone? His tone remained the same, a low rumble. It got wiped out a long time ago. There's nothing left. For reasons unexplainable, I began to feel uneasy, a sinking dread that was just beginning to form in my stomach. How, how is that possible? God is almighty, the devil can never best him, I said. The man slammed his hand against the wall, causing me to jump. There is no devil! There never was! I don't know where you people got that, but it wasn't for me! There is just myself and heaven. No angels, no saints, nothing. I created a place for you, and I created a place for me. Then I sat around and watched my creations, all from the comfort of my home, my heaven. Every once in a while, I'd poke my finger in and stir up some shit cause a little disaster or something, just to see how you'd react. If... If heaven is gone, where do our souls go when we die? I asked. Oh, I have no idea, the man said. I don't even know if you have a soul. I certainly didn't give you one. Why would I? I made you so I could have something to do. When you die, three more people take your place and I watch the circus go round and round. I have to say I'm impressed with the human race. You all have really come a long way. I never dreamed you'd create such wonders. Something outside the booth in the sanctuary crashed, but I ignored it. The man drawing all of my attention. Why are you here? I repeated mind blanking at the absurdity of what I was hearing. The man's voice turned quiet, an edge of unease now. Because I'm going to die soon. I can't hide down here much longer. They know where I am, and they're getting so close. Who? The man collected himself before whispering, the old horns. I could hear the shuffling of feet echoing outside the booth as people began to leave, probably annoyed at the long confessional, but I didn't care. Something about this man held me and terrified me. I'm not following, I said, a worm of unease snaking up my stomach into my chest. I thought you said there was just you and us. I thought you said the devil didn't exist. He doesn't, the man hissed. This is something else entirely. I have no idea what they are or where they came from. The logical part of me begged to end this conversation, but I couldn't let it go. What do they want with you? The old horns. Fear entered the man's voice. I don't know. They just showed up in heaven one day, taking me completely by surprise. They destroyed everything. Their power and wrath were... more furious than anything I have ever 
seen before. I had no choice. I ran. You ran? And came to Earth? I asked. I had to, he said. Where else is there to go? I don't know anywhere else but your world and mine. I have no clue where these entities came from or how they found me, but there is no stopping them. They will be here soon. I can't hide forever. I exhaled, trying to collect my thoughts. Okay, so... Say, hypothetically, this is all true. Why would you come here? To confession. If... You're God. What do you need to apologize for? The man was silent for a moment, and then said softly, Isn't this what you're supposed to do before you die? Truth be told, I have no idea what will happen to me when they catch up. But I'm scared. I'm really, really scared. I've done a lot of bad things, and, and this just seemed like the right thing to do. He trailed off miserably. I'm not the all-loving, wonderful God humanity thinks I am. I've done things to you people that sicken me. I don't know why I did them, but I did. You can look back on history and probably pick out the events I had a hand in. They're pretty obvious. You know how people always say, why would God let that happen? Well, it's because I'm an asshole. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the shit I've made people go through. You didn't deserve it. I get... I get pushing the envelope and you Christians never lost faith in me. You would find ways to make sense of it all. Always giving me the glory. Oh, shit. I'm so sorry. I didn't say anything the weight of his words collapsing in on me like the walls of a cave, trapping me in their conviction. How could I believe any of this? It was nonsense. And yet... Another crash echoed in the sanctuary, and this time I took notice because it filled with silence. Oh no, I heard the man whisper. Fear stirring his voice. What's wrong? I asked quietly. I heard the shuffle of a curtain and then the creak of wood. They're here. I swallowed hard. Who? The old horns. Something dropped into the pit of my stomach and I was suddenly very on edge. I leaned forward one hand resting on the curtain in front of me. Don't open it. Do not look at them, the man hissed. Why? I whispered, my voice unsteady now. Just don't, he said urgently. My time here is done. I'm at the end of my road. Stay in your booth until you hear silence again. It will be safe then. This is insane, I whispered. There's nothing out there. The man leaned into the screen, his voice earnest. I know I have no right to ask this of you. But please... Have faith in me. One last time. My hand remained frozen. My sweaty fingers plastered to the curtain. 
I was paralyzed, torn between the madness of his story and the horrific, sinking feeling I felt in my chest. Please, the man begged now. Absolve me of my sins and I will leave you all alone. Forever. Voice shaking, mind spinning, I released the curtain and turned to the screen. Something moved outside the booth. A scraping sound across the marble floors. I made the sign of the cross, voice trembling. I absolve you of your sins. Go in peace. The man exhaled heavily, relief filling him. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Suddenly, a noise blasted through the church so loud I had to cover my ears, my heart leaping into my throat. It was the blast of a low horn, a long, single note that rattled me to the bone. As the sound faded, a drop of sweat ran down my face. What in the hell? It's time, the man said. Wait, I cried, pressing my face against the screen. Don't go out there. Please! The man's voice softened. Maybe this is how it was supposed to be. I never sent someone to die on a cross for your sins. But I do love you. I love all of you. And I cannot thank you enough for keeping me company all these years. You truly are an incredible people. God bless, Father. God bless. And then, I heard the curtain rustle as he stepped out into the sanctuary. His footsteps echoed away from me, and I slammed my hands over my ears again as another horn sounded. My breath blew sour across my tongue and I sat panting, waiting, sweat rolling down my spine. I heard the man speaking to something. But I couldn't understand him, his voice muffled. My hands clenched my pants and every part of me screamed to look. But I resisted, teeth grinding together as I squeezed my eyes shut. I began to count in my head, desperately needing to focus on something. One. Two. Three. Four. Another ear-splitting horn sounded off. The low note so loud I heard the confessional booth creak against the blast. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. I opened my eyes. I had just felt something change. Something in the air, a shift in energy, a draining of something that was no longer there. I sat panting for a few moments longer and then let out a long breath, releasing the tension I had been holding inside of me. Cautiously, I reached out and grasped the curtain in front of me. I stood my old bones sighing, and dragged a shaking hand across my brow. I opened the curtain, and the sanctuary stood empty. Not long after that, I gave up the cloth. I just couldn't do it anymore. Something about that day shook me to the very essence of my being. I've discussed the event with a couple of other priests, and they just don't understand. I don't blame them. 
When I recite my story, it sounds like the ramblings of a madman. Who would alter their life so drastically based on one interaction? Especially considering the circumstances. But I have. And I don't regret it. Something about prayer just feels so... empty now. I don't know what's going to happen when I die. In truth, no one does. But what I do know is what I felt that day inside the confessional. That was real. When I strip away everything else, all the questions and oddities, that twist in my gut is what remains. I can't explain what I witnessed. I can't rationalize the bizarre sounds I heard. I can't reenact the conviction I heard in that man's voice. But it was there. And it was real. And that is what I have put my faith into. You've been listening to The Old Horns by author Elias Witherow. Oh, maybe you thought it ended there. Well, you clearly skipped the intro then, but I know you're busy. And I'm also happy to disappoint because we've got one more tale for you this evening. And on that, I'd like to note that the following story contains scenes of violence that some may find upsetting. Listener discretion is advised. And now, without further ado, from author Elias Witherow, I give you... I am not a saint... I've had an effect on people ever since I was a child. I can't explain it, and it's driven me to the brink of insanity. I never asked or prayed for it. In fact, I don't even know if I believe in God. But the circumstances around my unique condition aren't natural, or even human. There was a time when I thought I had been cursed with some kind of spiritual intervention. Even if that were the case, I don't know what purpose it would possibly serve. I first noticed I was different when I was in kindergarten. I was engaged in some minor dispute with another boy in class. I don't even remember what we were fighting over. But I got angry and punched the kid in the face. He went down, clutching his mouth, and began to cry. His lip began to bleed, and instead of just lying there, though, he got up, wiped his eyes, and gave me a hug. The teacher saw it happen, and I thought I was going to be punished, as I should have been. Instead, she praised me for doing the right thing, and the next day my class had cake in my honor. Even at that age, this confused me. I had always been taught to do the right thing. Respect others. Listen to your elders. Television, media, literature, and outside social interactions built the same constructs of normal human behavior we were all supposed to abide by. I saw others getting in trouble for acting out, for talking back, or for being violent. But never me. I was always the exception. Whenever I did anything bad, I was applauded, admired, and rewarded. This led to a very confused upbringing, as you can imagine. The constant positive repercussions of my bad behavior seemed to exist in a bubble, and were judged by a set of rules that were not only alien, but incomprehensible. As I grew up and went through school, I began to test the limits of what I could get away with. And, no matter what I did, my seemingly immortal morality remained unstained. I was gifted countless things, 
praised my other parents and admired my teachers and peers. It was madness, and I had the self-awareness to realize that. One time in fourth grade, I wanted to trade lunches with one of my friends. He refused, and so I knocked his food to the ground and stomped it to mush. Terrible, right? Well, some teachers saw that, and what did they do? They went out and got me exactly what I wanted from the store and presented it to me in front of the whole class. They all clapped. They all smiled. Even my friend, the one I had attacked, told me he was glad I was his buddy and invited me to his house after to play Xbox. In seventh grade, there was a girl I had a crush on. I tried to kiss her, but she told me she didn't want to. So, I grabbed her by the shoulders and shoved her against the wall and screamed in her face. Told her she was ugly, and I didn't want to kiss her anyway. She started to cry, but after a moment she wiped her eyes and told me she didn't deserve someone as great as me. A teacher had seen the whole thing and pulled me to the side. She told me I had been brave and acted with maturity. She led me into an empty classroom and showed me her tits. Then, she let me touch them. I knew I could do whatever awful thing I wanted to her, and so I twisted one of her nipples as hard as I could, digging my nails into her soft flesh. She started to bleed, and I could tell she was in pain, but I didn't stop. Not until she began to sob. I should have been locked up for something like that. My teacher kissed me on the mouth afterward and told me I was a good boy, that she wished her own son would be more like me. And the insanity of that statement is that if her son did what I did, he'd get into a hell of a lot of trouble. He'd be sent to counseling, pumped full of medication, shipped off to a school for troubled kids. I saw it all the time. People doing things I did every day and getting punished for them. High school hit and I turned into a monster. I felt invincible. The moral bridge I had been trying to balance myself on completely collapsed during that time. I stole whatever I wanted, skipped class as often as I pleased, beat up kids I didn't like, and fucked whoever I had a passing horny thought about. I was a tornado of unrest, angst, and carelessness. Why? Because I never had to deal with any kind of fallout. I was always slapped on the back, given a toothy grin, and told what a swell guy I was. During my first year of college, I hit celebrity status because I ran over one of my professors with my car... I hated the guy, not because he did anything to me personally, but because he always smiled at this junior I had a crush on. So I waited for him one night in the parking lot and ran him down. It took a couple of passes too. I heard his bones break beneath me, his screams and that awful whine of my car as it struggled to get over his mangled form. Before he died, I went to his side and watched him take his last breath. Around a mouthful of blood, he smiled and thanked me. I caved his head in with my heel. The next day, there was an article in the paper about what I had done. What was the headline? Local hero stands up to biased teacher. Sure, they buried him and people were sad, but there was never any anger. Even the professor's family held no ill will. In fact, they called me soon after and told me they respected what I had done and apologized for the dead man. It was then, that night that I began to wonder if I was a god. By the time I hit my twenties, I was almost always in the news. 
My face was plastered to hundreds of billboards. My name was on the cover of dozens of magazines. Everyone looked up to me, praised me, practically worshipped me. I was given money, cars, houses, boats, whatever the hell I wanted. All I needed to do to get these things was something terrible. Didn't like my Miami mansion? No problem. I kidnapped a popular pop star at one of the clubs I frequented and tortured her in front of a webcam. I broadcasted it live on my website, something that had been set up for me for just such an event. The next day, a billionaire from Italy called and told me I had inspired him, that my actions had moved him, brought him to tears. He gave me a 12-bedroom house on a 40-acre plot of land. When I was 25, I lusted after a famous movie star. We'll call her Fran. I met her at a high-society party I had been invited to. Flashy cars, expensive clothes, cigar smoke, and plastic smiles. When I was introduced to her, I thought we hit it off, that she was into me. But during my follow-up afterward, she made it clear she was not romantically interested. Sure, she respected and thought the world of me, but so did everyone else. I couldn't make people love me. I couldn't make them want to be with me, to share a life with me. I was an icon to her, nothing more. Her rejection sent me into a spiral of depression and hatred. I wanted to kill her for turning my affection aside, because that's just what I fucking did. That's how I dealt with things. That's how I had obtained everything I had ever wanted. Destroy, kill, steal, fuck, rape, and watch the masses bow down before me in admiration. Watch them shower me with every material thing I could ever want. So what did I do? How did I cope with this loss of connection I so desperately wanted? I went to her parents' house and put a gun to her father's head. I made him call Fran over to the house. When she arrived, I made her take off all her clothes and pretend she was a cow while I jerked off on her back. All the while, I kept the gun to her father's head and made him watch. After I ejaculated, I made Fran's mother lick it off her skin. And they thanked me the whole time, eyes shining with sickly veneration. Even Fran, who held no desire for my attention, smiled at me. And, for a second, I thought I saw a shadow of love in her expression. Or whatever I thought love was, I misinterpreted it. I mistook it. I thought I was winning her over by being the monster everyone wanted. So I shot her father in the head, blew his brains out all over the floor. Screams followed, but were cut short as glistening eyes widened and glorified expressions of worship took over. I went to the kitchen and got a knife. I thought I was on a roll. That look... In Fran's eye, it was growing brighter. Perhaps I had to push things even further. I sat down in a chair and got Fran's mom down on her knees, then pushed her head into my lap and sold it off. I never broke eye contact with Fran, who just watched, mouth agape, her eyes glowing with absolute wonderment. When I was finished, I pushed the headless corpse away and asked Fran to marry me. She just shook her head, saying nothing, tears running down her face with a smile so 
big I could have shoved her mom's severed head into it. I left, overwhelmed with a sense of loss so great I thought I would die beneath it. I spent the next month locked in my L.A. mansion. I dragged myself to death and injected every kind of poison I could find into my veins. I blanked out, zoned out, took off to some other place. When I came out of my days weeks later, the president wanted to meet me and shake my hand. The film crew wanted permission to make a documentary about me. My mailbox was flooded with money I didn't need, items I didn't want, and praise I did not deserve. It made me sick. It made me enraged. Why was I like this? Why was I able to get away with this? Why didn't anyone punish me for my actions? Why did I sit at the top of the world and feel so goddamn hopeless? Why didn't anyone fucking love me? What was I doing wrong? It may seem obvious to an outsider, but to me it was chaos. It was around that time that I noticed the man with the bandaged face. It was coming out of a store I had just robbed, my pockets stuffed with cigarettes, junk food and energy drinks. He was leaning against my car, arms crossed, dull eyes poking out from white cloth. His appearance stopped me dead in my tracks, a sudden tremor running through me. He was wearing a black button-up, jeans, and looked completely normal except for his wrapped features. He apprised me without any expression, our eyes meeting and locking. He didn't move. He didn't speak. He simply reclined casually against my car, as if waiting for me to do something. And something told me. Something warned me. Whispered that I needed to stay away from him. So I turned down the sidewalk and strode in the opposite direction, heart inexplicably racing. I chanced to glance over my shoulder and felt my blood turn to ice. He hadn't moved, but he was still watching me. As I put distance between us, a horrible familiarity began to emerge from the depths of my memory. I had seen this man before. In that moment, I couldn't place it, but I knew I had seen him before. His presence jarred my memory, dug at it with insistent certainty. It was like a layer of my past suddenly unfolded, revealing a trail of hidden encounters. I ripped open a pack of cigarettes and lit one as I walked, racking my brain for some clue. It wasn't until my second smoke that I remembered. I stopped and stared, horrified, into the middle distance. The pieces fell into place. The memory rebuilt itself. They were so fleeting so minute that I almost lost them again. My sixth birthday party. I was at a pizza parlor with my friends. The man had been there, sitting alone at a table in the corner. Twelve years old, going to the movies. He had sat a couple of rows behind me. It had been a horror movie and I thought it was just some weirdo who had dressed up for it. I had made fun of his bandaged face to my friends. We all laughed loudly. High school. During the bad times. My neighbor's dog had been barking all night. It kept me up. I had gone down that morning and killed it with a shovel. When the deed was done, I looked across the street. My hands splattered with blood. 
The man had been there. He was across the street, hands in his pockets, watching me. He stayed like that until I went inside. Twenty-two, drunk as hell, stumbling through bar, punching anyone who got in my way as I staggered to the bathroom. I had thrown up. Blearily, I remembered he had been sitting in the adjacent stall, door open, hands resting casually on his knees. He never said a word to me. And now this, here, he was back, and I had no idea what the hell he wanted, or who he was. I just knew, felt, that he was a danger to me. I managed to get back to my apartment without another sighting and made an impulse decision to fuck off to Europe for a couple of months. Within the day, I was on a private plane throwing back expensive bourbon and staring out at the Atlantic Ocean. The alcohol didn't have the desired impact I wanted, but I kept pouring anyway. I let the drone of the engines fill my head, but it wasn't enough to stop the insistent thoughts, the memories of the bandaged man. As the hours passed, I uprooted more of them, like snippets of film, little flashes of previous sightings. I wanted to stop thinking about it, so I closed my eyes and fell asleep. When I woke up, we were landing. I was groggy, cranky, a little hungover. I just wanted to get to my hotel, close the blinds, and keep sleeping. The limo driver was a little too chatty on the way over, so I told him to shut his goddamn mouth and slam the divider closed. The next couple of weeks went by in a haze. I was irritable the entire time, never seeming to get what I wanted out of whatever experience I sought. I pumped a ton of drugs into my system, went to every club and party I could find, drank daily until I threw up, and caused enough property damage to put a whole country in debt. I also killed four people. In my wake, I left the usual trail of wide-eyed adoration. I didn't know what I was doing anymore. I was becoming violently restless, and I had no idea how to suppress it. My baseline for sobriety plummeted, my head vibrated, and my fuse was at an all-time low. By the end of the fourth week, my knuckles had permanent scabs. I would often come back to my elaborate residence to piles of packages, gifts, from admirers. I didn't even open them. I burned them. But this perpetuated the cycle, and they kept coming. One time, a couple of years past, I had tried to stop my rising fame. I had controlled myself mellowed out my behavior to a place that bordered normality. After about a month, people began to forget about me. It wasn't as if I were disappearing, but there was a noticeable dip in attention. The money stopped coming in. The cars, boats, and offers began to dry up. All because I was trying to do the right thing. What I knew I was supposed to be doing... But after a lifetime of attention and freedom, this new reality was both alien and terrifying to me. I was becoming invisible. And so I did what I knew how to do. What I was rewarded for. After six weeks of clean living, I went on a horrible spree. I picked an apartment building at random and went inside with a knife and an axe. Not many people made it out. After, if they did, it was usually because I shoved them through a window. These weren't people to me. That was an outlook I had parted ways with long ago. These were paychecks I was cashing in. These were the bricks I needed to lay to continue down the path I had been set down. 
I didn't really know how to feel bad for being bad. When I walked out of that building, sweating, exhausted, and covered in blood, I found myself facing an ocean of police lights. When they saw it was me, they lowered their weapons. Their shoulders relaxed, they began to smile and greet me. They talked like they had just witnessed a miracle. In that moment, I wanted to explode. I wanted to detonate myself and cease to exist. If I had been a braver man, I would have. Sitting in my bedroom, the European countryside expanding out my window, I felt like I had that night outside the apartment complex. I felt like I had reached the end of another chapter, but I wasn't sure my book held another. I looked around me at the empty liquor bottles, the needles, the self-destruction. This was who I was. This was what I had built for myself. The world lay at my fingertips and all I had to do was punch it hard enough to bleed. I covered my face with my hands, feeling hollow. A knock came at the door. I looked up, eyes bloodshot. Without thinking, I walked across the room and opened it. The man with the bandaged face stood in the doorway. My eyes went wide, and I took a step back, almost tripping over an empty tequila bottle. You, was all I whispered before he came in, closing the door behind him. He didn't ask for permission. He soared across the room and settled onto the bed, sitting quietly at the edge, as if waiting for me to gather myself enough to hold a conversation. I just stood staring at him with my back against the door. Finally, he turned his head enough so that our eyes met between his bandages. Been looking for you, he said after a moment, his voice all edges and canyons. I didn't move from the door, my heart slogging past the shit in my system. Why are you following me? Because we need to have a conversation. I have nothing to say to you. Well... I have things I need to say to you, so come over here and sit down. I'm not going to hurt you. Hesitantly, I skirted the corners of the room and slunk over to a chair opposite him. Our eyes never broke their connection. He didn't seem threatening, but he also wasn't smiling beneath his bandages. We stared at one another for a moment before he spoke again. I am pretty disappointed in you. Excuse me? I said I'm pretty disappointed in you. You've gone completely off the deep end. I shook my head confused. What the hell are you talking about? He leaned forward, lacing his fingers together beneath his chin. They expected better. My eyes turned to slits. Who? The old horns. I sat back, cocking an eyebrow. I'm afraid I have no fucking clue what you're talking about. The man with the bandages didn't move, his voice low. But you know that you're different than everyone else? Correct? I feel like that's pretty obvious. They chose you. The man continued, picked you out of a metaphorical hat, and what have you done with your moral freedom? The fear I had felt earlier began to ebb away, replaced by a rising anger. Look, pal, you better start explaining this nonsense quick. I don't really have a whole lot of patience these days. His eyes went empty. Clearly. Who the fuck are you? I snarled. Someone 
who's been gifted the burden of watching you all these years. I can't tell you how many times you've let me down. You haven't made this job easy. Well, I'm sorry if my heart doesn't bleed for you. Can I ask you something? The man asked suddenly. Oh, Jesus. You've been given something no one else has ever been given. Complete lack of moral boundaries. He quickly shook his head. No, not just that. They made it even harder on you. They decided to reward your bad behavior. Your evil. I am not blind to how difficult it must have been for you at times. I only watched you from a distance. I wasn't witness to whatever warfare went on in your head. But I will tell you this, as an outsider, it didn't look like you even tried to be a good person. Once you saw the benefits of being a bastard, you went hard and heavy and never looked back, except for that one month. But you made up for that, didn't you? He placed a hand to his wrapped temple. But I'm getting off topic. My question is this. Given the chance to do it all over again, would you do anything differently? I kept my tongue locked behind clenched teeth. My hands were shaking, and I balled them up into fists. My head thundered beneath a mountain of stress, despair, and anger. My body buckled beneath the years of chemical abuse I had put it through. My thoughts sloshed together as I ripped them apart, searching for answers. Finally, I stood, towering over the bandaged man. My voice hissed from the furnace in my chest. Who the fuck are you to judge me? I managed to gasp. How the hell could you possibly lay blame at my feet? I never asked for this. I didn't want to be like this. I am not responsible for the way people react to my actions. This is simply how I get by. This is how I've learned to live. I mean, Jesus, this is how I've been conditioned. My whole life, I have gotten a pat on the head for things I knew were not normal. I pointed at my shuddering skull. And that's not something that goes away. If no one tells you that what you're doing is wrong, then is it really? The bandaged man stood, facing me. I could smell something sour beneath his wrapped face. Of course it is, he whispered. And you've known it this whole time. Get out, I snarled, pointing toward the door. I don't ever want to see you again. Oh, I'm not going anywhere. I bared my teeth at him. I'm not someone you want to talk to like that. The man grunted, disgusted. Don't act like you're invincible. I'm already disgusted enough by you. I could throw you out the window right now. I threatened, heat rising. And in the morning, someone would throw a party in my honor. And then... He said something that froze the inferno in my throat. Yeah, and how much longer do you think that's going to last? I stepped away from him, faltering. What the hell is that supposed to mean? He sat back down on the bed, exhaling wearily. I think the old horns have seen enough. Something twitched in my neck. The old horns. That's the second time you've mentioned them. What is that? 
What exactly are you talking about? You are not a religious man. You wouldn't believe me. I stood where I was. Why don't you try me? He ran his hand slowly over his head, his fingers running over the white cloth bound to his face. They came out of nowhere. They destroyed everything. Whatever theories you have about death and what comes after, they're wrong. The old horns wiped it all out. They've taken over. It is just them now. I sat down, feeling my stomach begin to buckle. Afterlife? He raised his eyes to mine. They are testing you. All of you. You're a new curiosity, one of the last. They're debating whether they should eliminate your entire existence. And not just yours. Everyone's. My throat tightened. Do you mean? He smiled sadly. You're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. He looked down at his hands, and his voice sank. And I am afraid you have failed. This is insane. He looked back up at me. I know it is. Trust me, I wasn't ready for this either. I squinted at him, leaning forward. Who... are you? He just smiled that sad smile and touched his bandaged face. Someone who is being punished. I spun around slowly, raking my hands through my hair, shoulders tense. What if I don't believe you? Then just keep doing what you're doing. It's probably too late to change things anyway. I'm afraid they have already made their decision. He covered his face with his hands. And I don't think they like what they've seen. I went to the window, mind reeling, and pressed my forehead against the glass. The sun was settling. How can I believe any of this? I'm not asking you to. I just needed to warn you. I'm going to die for coming here. But I think I'm ready. They've already done so much to me. His fingers traced his face. I closed my eyes against the glare of the sun. I think... I think you should probably leave. He reached for the doorknob. Try. And then he was gone, leaving me in the impossible silence of my own thoughts. The heat from the window sank into my skin and rippled across my mind. The insanity of what I had just been told stretched the very fabric of possibility. It couldn't be true. It couldn't. But I had always known something was wrong. And where did that leave me? What was I supposed to do with this conglomeration of nonsense? I peeled myself away from the window, head splitting. I felt sick, tired, and completely empty. I looked around my room, letting my eyes linger on all the false promises of happiness. A thought entered my mind without warning, and with all the force of an avalanche. Where had all this gotten me? I was miserable, alone, and depressed. In the material sense, I had everything I could possibly want or desire. Why wasn't that enough? What was I lacking? A partner? Friendship? Love? Family? Were those things someone like me could even begin to hope for? 
Could I really abandon all this wealth and power in pursuit of something that might not even exist for me? Was being a good person worth giving up everything else? The bandaged man's last bit of advice echoed back to me. Try. I sat down on the bed hard and sank my head into my hands. A half-empty bottle of bourbon lay between my feet. I reached down and picked it up. I unscrewed the cap and raised it to my lips. Suddenly, beyond the walls of the sky, a low horn echoed over the glowing landscape. It came from the heavens, a single, long note. Eyes wide, I put the bottle down. You've been listening to I Am Not a Saint by Elias Witherow. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week, when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumbed from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. And also be sure to check out my expanding catalog of audiobooks on audible.com. The more I sell, the less day job I have to work, and the more recording I can do. You understand. Both of tonight's stories were written by and brought to you courtesy of Elias Witherow. Elias Witherow is a New England-based author that strives to breathe new life into the horror genre. After a slew of short fiction, Elias began work on his first novel, The Black Farm, and hasn't stopped since. Aimed at the bizarre, outlandish, and depraved, he hopes his stories disturb and entertain readers looking for something a little darker. You can learn more about Elias or enjoy more of his work at our official horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, or at Thought Catalog, or follow him on Facebook, Twitter, or Reddit. You can also purchase many of his books on Amazon.com, so do yourself a favor and check him out today. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, Please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. And again, don't forget about those audiobooks. See the show notes for a link to audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you so much for your time. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you will get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill... For yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night, sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and 
a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.